Greetings. To what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I'm Lex Eve, and welcome back to another installment of Walk Magic. So, I thought I'd switch things up today and lay aside magic and theory and practice for a video on a topic I've been thinking about for a long while now, and that is how to build the vital sixth sense, which is a step in occultism that cannot be overemphasized. Let's begin. When I first read Cloud Upon the Sanctuary by Carl von Eckhartshausen about nine years ago, there were several quotes which, when put together, I knew were very important. Now bear with me as I'm going to quote from letter one of this book and um, I'll piece it all together after the fact, so just tune in and just listen. Quote, Absolute truth does not exist for sensuous man. It exists only for interior and spiritual man who possesses a suitable sensorium, or, to speak more correctly, who possesses an interior sense to receive the absolute truth of the transcendental world, a spiritual faculty which cognizes spiritual objects as objectively and naturally as the exterior senses perceive external phenomena. This interior faculty of the man spiritual the sensorium of the metaphysical world is unfortunately not known to those who cognize only outside of it. For it is a mystery of the kingdom of God, the current incredulity towards everything which is not cognized objectively by our senses is the explanation for the misconception of truths which are, of all, most important to men. But how can this be otherwise? In order to see, one must have eyes, to, to hear, one must have ears. Every apparent object requires its appropriate senses. So it is that transcendental objects require their sensorium, and this said sensorium is closed in most men. It so paralyzes our spiritual speech that we can scarcely stammer words of sacred import, words we fully pronounced once and by virtue of which we held authority over the elements and, their ex and the external world. The opening of this spiritual sensorium is the mystery of the new man, the mystery of regeneration, and of the vital union between God and man. This exterior sensorium in man is composed of frail matter, whereas the internal sensorium is organized fundamentally from incorruptible, transcendental, and metaphysical substance. The first is the cause of our depravity and our mor mortality. The second is the cause of our incorruptibility and of our immortality. In the regions of the material and corruptible nature, mortality hides immortality. Therefore, all our troubles, trouble results from the corruptible mortal matter. In order that man should be released from this distress, it is necessary that the immortal and incorruptible principle, which dwells within, should expand and absorb the corruptible principle, so that the envelope of the senses should be open and man appear in his pristine purity. This natural envelope is a truly corruptible substance found in our body, forming the fleshy bonds binding our immortal spirits under the servitude of the mortal flesh. This envelope can be rent more or less in every man, and this places him in greater spiritual liberty and makes him more cognizant of the transcendental world. It is quite true that with new senses, we can acquire a sense of further reality. This reality exists already, but it is not known to us because we lack the organ by which to cognize it. One must not lay the fall to the percept, but on the receptive organ. With, however, the development of the new organ, we have a new perception, a sense of new reality. Without it, the spiritual world cannot exist for us, because the organ rendering it objective to us is not developed. With, however, its unfoldment, the curtain is all at once raised, the impenetrable veil is torn away, the cloud before the sanctuary lifts, a new world suddenly exists for us, scales fall from the eyes, and we are at once transported from the phenomenal world to the regions of truth. God alone is substance, absolute truth. He alone is He who is, and we are what He has made us. For Him, all exists in unity. For us, all exist in multiplicity. A great many men have no more idea of the development of the inner sensorium than they have of the true and objective life of the spirit, which they neither perceive nor foresee in any manner. 
Hence, it is impossible to them to know that one can comprehend the spiritual and transcendental, and that one can be raised to the supernatural, even to vision. The great and true work of building the temple consists solely in destroying the miserable Adamic hut in, and in erecting a divine temple. This means, in other words, to develop in us the inner interior sensorium or the organ to receive God. End quote. So, if you have studied Crowley long and been through the literature and begun the practices of yoga and magic, much of this will make sense to you. Mentioned is a subtle envelope that bars us from perceiving the spiritual world. This is what hermetic magicians might call the veil of Isis. There's a light in our body that I believe breaks and rents that veil, prana, so I'll get more into this. Now this light is inaccessible in the ordinary person. By getting in touch with this energy, this light, this prana, chi, call it what you will, astral light, cultivating it and making it accessible, you open up a sensorium which allows for spiritual perception. The veil of Isis is rent. If not, if all of this is new to you, well, let me explain more. So as I said, there is a subtle force which flows through the bloodstream. It is called prana. Much like chi, it is a life force energy. It permeates through all things, especially the bloodstream. One can release large quantities of it, inducing spiritual states of being by performing various yogic techniques, specifically pranayama, which are breathing exercises, and kundalini yoga, which opens the energy center at the base of the spine, sending energy up the spinal column, activating each chakra in turn, and eventually raising kundalini up to the ajna, which is the third eye, and the sahasrara chakra, which floats above the head. Once all chakra are activated, this brings about the state many call enlightenment, and you can perceive what we will call God. Magic, especially ritual, in conjunction with Hermetic Kabbalah, does much the same thing as yoga. Pathworking, this type of initiation, one begins at the bottom of the tree of life and through various initiations, yoga, magical exercises on a daily basis, one can ascend the 10 spheres on the tree of life, ending up in Kether, the highest sphere, which is synonymous with the divine light, meaning one in Kether has achieved union with God. Now, this is an incremental process. There are many, many milestones and tons of requirements, some variously different for each individual has different needs, some the same for each person. We will then cover here the many practices and requirements which are the same for everyone. So let's talk about some of these. In Liber E, there is a much overlooked practice in section two, physical clairvoyance. You go through your tarot deck picking one card at a time, holding it and looking at its back. You attempt to call which card it is. Even if you do the worst possible, you will still get one in 78 guesses correct. By merely guessing, there is a good chance you will get one in five. A good way to start is instead of guessing the exact card, you guess the suit. And those are discs, swords, cups, wands, or a trump, a major arcana. When you get two of every seven correct, I, I recommend moving on to guessing the exact card. If you guess a card which has harmonious qualities with the actual card, this is a partial success and very good, for it indicates that you may, you're may you feeling the energy present. For example, if you pull Atu 1, the Magus, and your guess was the Eight of Discs, this is a good guess because the Eight of Discs is ruled by the Sun in Virgo, which is quite related with Mercury and the Sun, Tefareth, has a cl close relationship with Chakma, the sphere of the Magus. Crowley writes at the end of physical clairvoyance, in that section of Libri, that success in this practice is when you guess 15 to 20 of 78 cards correct every single time. I recommend going a bit further, say 25 correct every single time you do this practice. Ultimately, this practice trains the intellectual part of the soul to perceive mentally what is hidden from you. Your third eye begins to stimulate, and you are accessing the astral realm to feel the energy of and see the actual card itself.
Now, Liberty is often scary and neglected by magicians, but its practices form the foundation of a successful practitioner and must be followed through completely. Asana must be mastered, and it does wonders for cultivating prana, and it is also the first step towards performing, pra performing pranayama as you sit in your chosen asana position to do your breathing exercises. Next, you go on with pranayama exercises, and this is paramount to this process. Prana is the yogic life force, which must be built up in the system to then properly activate one's chakra and to do kundalini yoga later. Even just looking at the name pranayama, as I said, prana means life force and yama means control. So by controlling your breathing, doing pranayama, you're learning to control an unconscious process breathing, which is normally an unconscious process. Thereby, you cultivate prana, which you're normally unconscious of, and you're learning how to control that also within your body and learn how to eventually move it through your body. But first, you have to cultivate it. Follow the methods of yoga Crowley outlines in Magic Book 4 and 8 lectures on yoga, and one day, you may very well, uh, may very well reach samadhi, which I consider very much uh, in line with third eye perception. Next comes ritual magic which should be done in conjunction with yoga from the very beginning. Looking at OTO's mineral degree, their initiation works upon the Ajna and Muladhara chakra, opening both the second to the top and the lowest chakra, almost like the positive and neg negative ends of a battery, allowing energy to begin to move up and down the spine and outward or inward of the body. This helps to give the candidate the necessities of what is later required to have a spiritual experience. Likewise, my teacher early on gave me a very simple yet highly effective sex magic technique to consecrate and open the third eye with seminal fluids, called simply the third eye consecration. You recite chapter 1 of the Book of the Law, focusing all your will upon invoking new weed. Finally, at orgasm, you focus simultaneously upon invoking Nuit as well as opening the Ajna Chakra or your third eye. You collect the sex fluids harvested and anoint your third eye with a single point or an equilateral cross using the right index finger. If done correctly, a small vortex should spin on the brow line and a serpentine beam of light should then extend outward from the center of the brow about six inches in length. Over time, the visual should solidify more and more, and the sensation should become more intense. Also, that serpentine bar of light should become more fluid, more lifelike, even more serpent um, in appearance. Of course, the foundational practices of magic must be learned and committed to memory. These should be performed daily, especially at the beginning. Those are the lesser banishing rituals of the pentagram and hexagram star ruby and star sapphire, Libra Resh, the mass of the phoenix, and I could go on with those, uh, Libra Vivel Regula is another interesting pentagram ritual. Um, all of those type of base level rituals should be done to cultivate energy and to propel you forward and to build up the 93 current, which you're trying to allow yourself, almost like rowing down a river on a boat, you want that current to be able to carry you doing the practices causes that current to go. If you're not doing your practices, there's no current, your boat's not going anywhere. See what I mean? Now, I can't explain each of these practices in detail now, as that is too lengthy and besides the point, but you must understand and do, do them daily to get the results. In short, however, you are activating many subtle spiritual epicenters in the body and brain. You are disciplining yourself and you are communing with the spiritual beings which govern physical reality. In time, they go from mental projections to fully realized and fluid beings. Most importantly, you are working on the astral plane and learning how to see and construct astral light to various ends. You can go through the Equinox Volume 1 and regard this Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn for many more practices and exercises. Also, I believe it's Donald Tyson's The Magician's Workbook which you can go to for plenty more practices. Now, last on practical points about activating the sixth sense, I need mention divination. Similar to clairvoyance, I would argue that you are utilizing a similar part of the soul and mind to perform it, 
but its aim is different. You can seek to understand anything from questions about the mundane to the most inner workings of the universe by utilizing divination. What's more, there are hundreds of ways to perform divination, and each person should experiment with as many as possible and develop the best way for them to do divination. In the description below is a Wikipedia article outlining a ton of different forms of divination. Try a bunch and see what works best for you. Now, two of the most popular and important in the Lima are, of course, the Tarot, specifically using the Dolph deck, and the Yi King. Each of these topics deserves a video of their own, so I'm not going to explain everything about them, but I will explain why I believe they are vital to training or opening up your sixth sense. Beginning with the tarot, it consists of 70 cards and over the centuries has been discovered to fit perfectly with the schema of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. Ten spheres for the ten number cards, with four suits for the four olam, or four worlds, or planes of the elements corresponding with yod heh the court cards, too, play with the four worlds and demonstrate how each element, each of the elements has each of the other elements in them in various quantities. For the Queen of Wands is the watery aspect of fire. Or take, for example, the Prince of Discs, who is the airy part of Earth. Then there are 22 major arcana which fit in with the 22 paths that connect the ten spheres and each corresponds with one of the 22 Hebrew letters and their correspondences in the magician's tables. These cards all interact with each other and open the door to a ton of meditations. You could meditate on one card, or one card with another card, or one card with two, three, four, up to 78 other cards, or 77 other cards. Perhaps in total there are over 450,000 combinations that are possible to meditate upon with the tarot. Now, keep in mind, each card represents many aspects of the physical and spiritual universe, mankind, and divinity. So understanding the tarot to its fullest degree is equivalent and no less to understanding God. Take this quote from a garden of pomegranates, quote, it was only in the last century that we had the statement of Eliphas Levi that were a man incarcerated in a dungeon cell in solitary confinement without books or instructions of any kind. It would still be possible for him to obtain from this set of cards an encyclopedic knowledge of the essence of all sciences, religions, and philosophies." End quote. Now, when I read this quote well over a decade ago, I intuitively felt its truth through, and through the weight and power of the statement. What's more, I was in state prison at the time I first read the book, Garden of Pomegranates, and I was heavily immersed in the occult, as was possible given the situation. So, needless to say, it appealed to me. Speed up to the present day, I find that this quote is just as true, though I now have experience to back up the thesis. In short, I now understand that by studying the tarot and using it often, I have indeed been granted much gnosis, spiritual knowledge, and have felt the gravity of the power of the cards. By constant use, one is training, tra training their body, mind, and soul to see the universe past the physical shell. And when time after time you ask a question by doing a reading and then receive an answer that proves to be true, it leads to strengthening one's level of faith and belief. Now, much of this too applies to the Yi King, and I cannot go into the full system now, but I can explain it generally as well as ways that this applies to the sixth sense. The explanation, even if generalized, is lengthy, so I'm going to assume that you know the basics of the Yi King. So to use the Book of Changes, you throw coins or yarrow sticks to draw six lines. Each line is either whole, a yang, or split in half with a space, yin. Each line has a specific meaning and can and should be read first altogether, then individually, then in a set of two sets of three, the top half and the bottom half of the hexagram, which are the two triads. In the Book of Changes, there are 64 possible hexagrams. Prior to your throw, you will have asked your question, and then you are using the information of the six lines to answer it. You do, you do not get really a direct answer with the king, and this is part the part that really trains your sixth sense, which I'm going to call intuition from this point on. Each of these 64 chapters of the Yi King corresponding to one of the 64 hexagrams have several paragraphs written about it. 
These paragraphs are fully allegorical and are designed to make you look inward. You will get thoughts and sensations based on the information read, and this must be used to meditate upon to answer your question. You may even get a communication from a higher force while meditating, almost like a voice in your mind communicating with your soul to divine the information you are seeking. This, in short, is how the Yi King operates, and clearly, in my opinion and experience, is much quicker and more direct, even though it's allegorical in nature, than are the answers derived from by tarot. By daily practice over a long enough period of time, you will build the inner parts of your soul, awakening higher states of consciousness, and training the inner sensorium spoken of at the beginning of this video. So I hope you could see that divination is much more than fortune telling, which is just a device to answer questions. It's much more. And depose, uh, depending upon your chosen medium, it can be a device to study the body, the soul, the universe, God, or it could be a tool to awaken you to the perception of existence previously closed to you. Note that I call the sensorium from Cloud Upon the Sanctuary intuition. In the magician's tables, you can find a column called the parts of the soul. On path three, which is Bina, the mother, you will find Nishama, intuition, the intuitive part of the soul. Bina also corresponds with the Ajna Chakra, commonly called the third eye. By way of divination, you are in fact exercising the intuition and indeed stimulating the third eye. It is my belief the third eye is intertwined explicitly with the vital sixth sense spoken of by Eckhartshausen. That by stimulating the Ajna, a whole new view of the world becomes perceptible and a connection with all things is formed. If you look at A221, the universe, there is an open eye with the serpent extending forth from it, while the physical world is being destroyed, replaced by the first glimpse of the spiritual one underlying it. This is what awaits in store for those who follow the methods outlined above. Now, lastly, before closing, I just want to briefly explore senses of human beings to further define the sixth sense. We're taught very early on that we have five senses, touch, sight, hearing, taste, and smell. But even barring spirituality completely, I find this misleading and thoroughly incorrect. We have a sense of time. Like, have you ever forgot to set your alarm clock for a busy morning ahead, and yet you wake up almost exactly on, the time by, on that time by instinct? We have a sense of well-being intertwined with emotions. You know when you are content, and you know when something is horribly wrong, whether with health or by interacting with an untrustworthy person. We feel that something is off. There are plenty of other examples, but now what about this sense of intuition? Have you ever been alone, and though you have no way of knowing someone is suddenly there and staring at you, you f yet you feel their cold stare and you turn instinctively to look directly at them? Like, let's say you're stuck in traffic and another driver looks at you from their car next to yours. You feel it and look at them, if you've ever had that experience, which is very common. Or what about when you feel like what you're about to do for some reason feels wrong? Like you have a normal routine, walking home from work, yet that inner voice tells you not to go down that one street that particular day. Only to find out that had you not suddenly changed your route, or for no reason you decided but by that same voice to spend a dollar on a lottery, knowing you were going to win. And then it does happen that you do win. This intuition is what I'm speaking about, but it goes beyond the trivial and mundane events. Once trained, this voice gets louder, clearer, more bold, and can become a guide of one's will. For no reason known at the time, once trained, it will give you directions, whether, let's say, to quit your job or to apply to a new one in a totally new field. Or it might direct you to go to an event where you will meet the person who will change the entire trajectory of your life somehow. Or it may just tell you exactly which practices to do at which time. This, and much more, even union with God itself is possible by following the sixth sense, intuition. Just remember that it requires training. It is easy to delude oneself taking any fleeting idea that comes to mind and declaring it to be your higher genius. 
I've met many megalomaniacs in the course of my magical career who have no idea how lost they are. But to those of you who know, will, keep silent, and dare to go, to train yourself in the use of intuition and activation of the Ajna, there is truly something incredible in store for you. Quote, Peace, fidelity, domestic harmony, love between nations, will be the first fruits of this spirit. Inspiration of good without false similitude, the exaltation of our souls without too severe attention, warmth in the heart without turbulent impatience, will approach, reconcile, and unite all the various parts of the human race, long separated and divided by many differences, and stirred up against each other by prejudices and errors. And in one grand temple of nature, great and little, poor and rich, all will sing the praise of the Father of Love. End quote. And that was the very closing paragraph of Cloud Upon the Sanctuary. And with that, I end this talk. Love is the law. Love a new will. I'll catch you all in the next one.